Mr. Beast is suing himself. Kinda. You see, earlier this month, the news came out that Jimmy Beast, everyone's favorite AI-generated thumbnail face, was filing suit against his fast food brand, Mr. Beast Burger. Or more accurately, the company responsible for managing that brand, Virtual Dining Concepts, VDC for short. Why would he do that? Well, as the lawsuit claims, it was the result of years of bad burgers battering his beastly beef brand. The quality of the food that was being produced by VDC's army of restaurants was inconsistent, and in many cases, dangerous, resulting in a rapid erosion of Mr. Beast's food brand. So how did VDC respond? By pulling out the Uno reverse card, counter suing Mr. Beast for damage to their brand. Basically, they're saying that Mr. Beast's public statements about VDC actually caused significant damage to their bottom line. How much are we talking about here? Oh, you know, just a cool hundred million dollars. How's that for a thumbnail? Last to leave the courtroom wins nine figures. So who's right and who's wrong? The answer to that, my friends, is so much bigger than either of these two companies. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Food Theory, the show that dishes out the truth behind all your favorite brands. So, back in 2020, Mr. Beast, ever the trend spotter, had this brilliant idea, partnering with Ghost Kitchens to quickly scale up a food brand with his name on it. Now, that right there is already a lot to process, so let's just make sure we're all on the same page. Basically, a ghost kitchen is not Casper and his pals dishing up a load of baked ziti. It's a professional kitchen that works to make food for another brand. You know how ghost writers are people whose job it is to write books in secret for someone Else? Well, a ghost kitchen is basically that for food. It's a group of chefs working in a kitchen to cook up food for a restaurant that does not physically exist. The restaurant's name and menu appear on food delivery apps like Grubhub and DoorDash. People place their orders and then an existing kitchen somewhere out there in the world decides to cook it up. Sometimes those kitchens are, you know, actual kitchens in already established restaurants just looking to pick up a few extra tabs for extra business on the side. But oftentimes those ghost kitchens are working solely for the virtual brands in unusual places. In shipping containers, in parking lots, in places where you wouldn't expect your food to be coming from. It's weird, sure, but hey, food trucks are a thing. And on the surface, it seems to be a perfectly acceptable business model. Mr. Beast uses his reach to spotlight a menu of items he's approved, and then local chefs make it. That allows him to have hundreds of restaurant locations all over the country overnight, while giving extra work to chefs and other employees struggling to stay afloat. Jimmy is the marketing, virtual dining concepts is the actual business making the food. On paper, it really should be a win-win-win. Win. And financially, it certainly seemed to be, with Jimmy tweeting out in July of 2022 that Mr. Beast Burger had earned a hundred million dollars in revenue. But in reality, things aren't nearly so rosy. Ever since day one of Mr. Beast Burger's launch in 2020, there's been contention between Jimmy and Virtual Dining Concepts about burger quality control. Burgers coming out underdone, overcooked, underseasoned, with hair in them. Ooh. When you're relying on over a thousand different kitchens with a vast range of ingredients and staff training at their disposal, the product is never gonna be the same. For example, compare Matt Stoney's video. Oh, dude, look at all that beef. Look at all that cheese. Four smashed crispy beef patties. To what Eddie Burback got. This tastes like a cafeteria burger. I mean, the difference is obvious. This burger patty does not look like this burger patty. And this is something that's openly acknowledged by Jimmy's own team, as seen here in a clip of his manager, Reed, reacting to the opening of Mr. Beast Burger physical location. I mean, this is the problem with delivery is, you know, we have 1700 virtual locations and depending on where you order from, the burger experience might be different because you're getting it from a different restaurant. Uh, you're getting it from a delivery service, which it's really hard to control. Is it gonna take 20 minutes? Is it gonna take 40 minutes? You don't know. And then sometimes you're really relying on what does the restaurant have left? Maybe they don't have that specific potato bun that's being used. Maybe they have something else. And so this was the first time people were getting a amazing hamburger actually delivered to them sitting at a restaurant for the first time. And the the, the consistency of the product is just, it, it's different when you, when you can own it and it's your restaurant. But this year, the quality control issue finally came to a head. In May of 2023, the original video promoting the launch of the brand was made private. And when someone asked if this was a sign that Mr. Beast Burger was done, Jimmy responded saying that the problem was that he couldn't guarantee the quality of the order. This is also something he repeated in July in a now deleted tweet when responding to a fan's complaint about their subpar Beast Burger. Quote, sadly, I can't get out of my deal with Beast Burger. He elaborated in a series of follow-ups about how the original intent of Beast Burger was to help restaurants make more money during the pandemic. Pandemic, but eventually it just became impossible to keep up quality working with restaurants that he doesn't own. When asked if this meant that he was retiring the brand, he said he would if he could, but the company he partnered with, VDC, wouldn't let him stop even though it was terrible for his brand. He acknowledged
acknowledge that a younger him had just signed himself into a bad deal. Which leads us then to today, with Jimmy filing a lawsuit against VDC claiming his contract with them should be null and void because they failed to uphold their part of the bargain. The kitchens under their management were sending out food that was, according to some of the fans who ordered it, revolting, disgusting, inedible, and likely the worst burger they ever had. Which, you know, is saying a lot when Burger King's Barbie burger is a product that exists. Looks like it's been slathered in Pepto-Bismol. But here's where things really get spicy. VDC responded with a lawsuit of their own. According to them, yeah, Jimmy was right. Mr. Beast Burger's reputation was destroyed, but it wasn't by them delivering mistaken orders, it was rather by Jimmy himself airing the dirty laundry publicly, retweeting and elevating the relatively few instances of people's dissatisfaction with the food, publicly complaining about not being able to get out of his contract. They claimed that he was engaging in a cash grab, trying to bully the company for his own monetary gain, and the damage done to their business, not just Mr. Beast Burger, but Virtual Dining Concept's complete brand of ghost kitchens, totaled over a hundred million dollars. So with lawsuits flying around in both directions, and potentially hundreds of millions of dollars on the line, who's right here? Now at first glance, Jimmy's case seems like it should be obvious. The biggest problem hurting the image of Mr. Beast Burger was the huge amount of complaints they got about their food. Any damage that Jimmy allegedly did to the brand by responding to or bringing attention to negative reviews, all of that happened only because VDC failed to uphold their end of the bargain. You know, actually making safe, high quality food. If there was no bad food, you would have no bad tweets, right? Except there's likely a number of angles that VDC will attack that premise from. The first would be the relative scale of the complaints. That in the food world, there's always gonna be negative reviews of a product, and that Mr. Beast, in responding to a small handful of them, made a mountain out of a molehill, overblowing a quality control issue that, relative to the volume of orders being placed, wasn't nearly as bad as it seemed. The second angle they'll likely be arguing was that it was never their job to provide consistent food. It was only their job to provide food that had the Mr. Beast name on it. That one's a little bit weird, we'll get to it. So let's take a big old bite and chew on some of the issues that are brought forth by this legal battle, shall we? And remember, I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. This is just me nerding out about the future of how food gets distributed. First, to address the idea that Mr. Beast overly fixated on the few bad reviews that Mr. Beast Burger received versus the mountain of orders that VDC fulfilled, we need to understand the average number of complaints and health violations a typical restaurant receives. A study by the National Restaurant Association found that about 7% of restaurants had critical violations, which are the most serious type of infraction for a food service provider. Critical violations are things that would include anything causing an immediate health problem for customers or employees. Stuff like cross-contamination of bacteria, raw meat being stored at improper temperatures, sewage backups, and a lack of running water to wash your hands. So how does Mr. Beast Burger compare? Well, we can't really know, but we can estimate and compare with other very similar service providers. We know for a fact that Virtual Dining Concepts has delivered 6 million orders based on the header on their site. And while not all of those are going to be coming from Jimmy's brand, we can assume that most of them are. Let's just say that Mariah Carey's cookies and Mario Lopez's tortas, yeah, they're probably not flying off the shelf as quickly as the burgers produced by the guy actively promoting his sandwiches to his hundreds of millions of followers, and then regularly giving away wads of cash to random orders. There might be a little bit more enthusiasm to buy one of those versus the others. We also know, thanks to this quote from March of 2021 from Robert Earl, founder of EDC, that a million burgers at that point had been sold. Quote, we've done one million entrees already, and it got so much attention. He's a wonderful partner. He's intent on building with us a big, permanent brand. Whoops. Yeah, that one didn't age too well, did it? Anyway, for the sake of argument, let's just do a real lowball here and say only one million orders have been placed for Beast Burger. So what's the relative volume that we're dealing with here? Well, according to the Mr. Beast complaint, the brand has received thousands of negative reviews. So let's take a high number of complaints, say 10,000, versus a low number of orders, say 1 million. That then gives us only 1% complaining about the quality of the Mr. Beast Burger, well below the 7% of restaurants with critical violations. Now, obviously, this isn't a perfect comparison. Getting a bad review online is very different from having a health code violation. But it does show that there may be something to Jimmy looking a bit too closely at all the negative tweets. 1% negative reviews across a million or more orders? That's a great hit rate. Or maybe not. Let's look at the question another way. While we don't have specific numbers about virtual dining concepts themselves, there has been a bunch of data released about other similar ghost kitchen service providers. Reef Kitchens is a company with a similar concept. A ghost kitchen company that operates delivery-only virtual restaurants. And in 2021, an investigation into the company found that out of the 61 Reef Kitchens operating and inspected in Florida, 58 violated at least one health and safety concern. Of those, 21 separate kitchens had themselves a high-level safety violation, ranging from a lack of soap for proper hand-washing of the chefs to storing meat at dangerously high temperatures. Two units even had sewage leaking into the kitchen. So overall, a third of Reef's operations in Florida had a high-level violation, 33%, way higher than the national average that we talked about before. 
before of 7%. Now to be fair, Reef only works out of non-traditional spaces like parking lots and shipping containers. Compare that to VDC, which has a mix of both non-traditional spaces and pre-established restaurant kitchens. So maybe VDC's handling of other brands is better? Nope, doesn't seem like it. I looked across the other brands in Virtual Dining Concepts roster and found a similar trend to Mr. Beast Burger. Negative reviews on account of incorrect orders, late deliveries, and the food just being bad. DJ Khaled's Another Wing boasts a three-star average on Grubhub. Steve Aoki's Pizza Aoki reviews don't fare much better. Food was late, cold, gross. Even actual chef Guy Fieri decided to partner with VDC to bring his Flavortown kitchen to the virtual world. We work with inside of, inside of restaurants in over 25 cities around the country where we build a virtual kitchen in that restaurant. Within a few months, the brand expanded to 160 locations. Guy Fieri was a jewel in the VDC crown because he was a real chef giving real legitimacy to the business. But look at the VDC website now. The brand is gone. Searching the Flavortown kitchen across food delivery apps completely vanished. The only remnants are its various one-star reviews on Yelp with a very similar refrain. I trusted the brand. Big mistake. The chicken guy sandwich I ate was not edible. The impression I'm getting is that there's a lot more stuff included in this that's not on the menu. Even Guy Fieri, experienced restaurateur, is struggling to find critical success with virtual kitchens. He bounced before his brand really suffered, just like Jimmy is looking to do now, but doesn't really seem able to do contractually. So really, it seems like Jimmy is in the right. He and many others have had their brands actively co-opted and weakened by these ghost kitchens operating irresponsibly. But unlike many other celebrities, doesn't seem like he's able to extract himself from the contract. So let's just talk about those contracts for a second, shall we? Because that actually brings up the second major issue with the case. Obviously, quality control is a huge problem, not just with VDC, but for the entire ghost kitchen industry. When you have a decentralized model and don't actively own any of the restaurants yourself, there's no real accountability there. If you're working in a Buca de Beppo, but you occasionally get a delivery order to Guy Fieri's Flavortown Kitchen, if that order sucks, it's not really coming back to you. There's no true way to hold you, the worker at Buca de Beppo, accountable. It's not your primary job after all. The health of the actual main business is always going to have to come first. And let's be honest, it's not like you were trained to do the menu items correctly anyway. Heck, probably didn't even have the right ingredients to make that item. You're just doing your best to replicate that one dish from that one fake menu amongst the hundreds of restaurants that may be operating out of your kitchen. I found 10 restaurants running out of the same kitchen. Does that sound like a lot of kitchens to you? Because if it doesn't, I lied. There are 44 restaurants on Uber Eats that all share this one address. So overall, there's not really a high likelihood of you getting that item right, nor is there much incentive to put in any extra effort. That is why these orders keep failing so hard. But then why isn't VDC themselves holding these restaurants accountable? Well, contractually, they might not have to. Now, while I wasn't able to get a hold of a contract for virtual dining concepts, I was able to find one for a similar company, Virtual Dining Brands. And let me just say the services they promise to provide are pretty simple to say the least. Here's the contract language language they have in there, quote, Virtual Dining is a business engaged in the development, promotion, advertisement, and sale of restaurant-prepared food through delivery application. For the purposes set forth, licensed products shall include mutually approved menu items for app-based delivery. That's it. No quality control, no minimum standard, no consistent recipe, just did we get food items branded with your name onto some Uber Eats menus? And if VDC's contract reads anything like that one, technically by the letter of the contract, they've done their job for Mr. Beast. Now, that seems insane, but that's also one potential danger of licensing out your brand. When a public figure licenses out their name or their likeness, you're basically given permission to another company to represent you out in the marketplace. They're using your intellectual property to produce or sell something. The nice thing about that is it's a quick way to scale up. Classic example of this in the YouTube space is with merch. Very few YouTubers are actively doing their own merch in-house. Instead, they're licensing their logos and catchphrases out to third parties in order to do that for them. That allows YouTubers to offer merch quickly without having having to buy a bunch of equipment for themselves. It also lowers the overall financial risk for them because they're not having to hire a bunch of new employees to manage those workflows. And hey, you'll probably wind up with a better product than if you did it yourself anyway, because presumably you're working with people who know that space. Case in point, our new Theoryware, which just launched. There's some amazing products in the mix, like this incredible waterproof jacket with adjustable Velcro sleeves, this awesome vegan leather purple jacket, or this crisp white button down with subtle circuit patterns around the neck. I couldn't have done any of that on my own. Instead, we part with people who know how
how to make quality clothing. Their background is, believe it or not, in cutting edge street fashion. And their expertise, plus our ideas, led to a really awesome collaboration and a slate of new products that you can buy right now while supplies last via the link that you see on screen. However, the downside if you enter into a relationship like this is that if that provider winds up being shady, you're the one having to clean up the mess. If your licensing contract isn't strict or specific enough and you're not keeping a close eye on the people who are using your brand, it's not them who are suffering, it's ultimately you that's left holding the bag. And I'm not talking about a cool bag like our new radioactive backpack available at theorywear.com. That's why restaurants like In-N-Out and McDonald's retain a ton of oversight over who's allowed to open up new establishments under their name. For one thing, they don't take all comers. It takes a rigorous application process, and once you clear the bar, you're still not done. You're committing a minimum of 20 hours a week to a franchise training program that lasts anywhere between 6 to 18 months. And after you've completed your basic training, then it's off to Hamburger University, which is a very real thing where franchise owners take classes on everything from management and strategy to company culture. And what do you get out of all of that training? You get yourself a consistent experience. A Big Mac is going to taste the same no matter what city or neighborhood you order it in. But with VDC, that attention to detail just doesn't seem to be there. And there doesn't really seem to be the necessary penalties in place to keep them incentivized to doing a good job for their clients. And you see, that right there is the issue with the entire ghost kitchen model. When everything's decentralized, not only do the mistakes pile up, but it becomes really easy to avoid responsibility. There's always someone else in the pipeline to blame. Always a layer of separation between you and the customer. VDC, in operating Mr. Beast Burger, got all the benefits of being a big brand. Like a huge number of customers signing up to buy food items from a name that they recognize. But apparently they weren't willing or equipped to bear the costs actually associated with delivering a consistent experience that would please the customer. And based on all their actions throughout this process, doesn't really look like they're contractually obligated to do it either. They just have to provide some food. Does any of this mean that the ghost kitchen model is inherently unworkable? No. At least, I'm not willing to say that just yet. There may just come a company that has their own hamburger university that'll provide actual training to standardize practices and quality, as well as give a clear line of accountability. It may just wind up being that the companies that manage and run the logistics of virtual kitchens also have to supply their own ingredients. But what does all of this mean for Mr. Beast now? Honestly, if I were to guess, I expect VDC to actually be able to keep the Beast brand for at least one more year. That ghost kitchen contract I mentioned earlier was for a three-year license, and I expect the VDC one to look pretty darn similar. I also suspect that they'll try really hard to hold on to Jimmy. Looking at the roster of their current clients, Jimmy is one of the only ones still on the site, making me think that the options there are limited. And without Guy Fieri, Jimmy is really the only jewel still left in their crown. To be honest though, I hope I'm wrong about this theory. I normally try to stay neutral with these sorts of episodes, but in this case, I gotta admit, I really feel bad for Jimmy in this sort of situation because I know how it sucks to have someone do a poor job with your brand, to trust someone to do their job, and then them to just utterly botch it, and how one bad contract can ultimately have ripple effects that affect your business for years. It sucks. But whatever the solution, one thing is clear. Right now, the food for VDC seems to be secondary to the business, and even though business may be booming, when the food gets neglected, everything implodes. I guess that's what happens when you're on the bleeding edge. The bleeding, unsanitary, probably shouldn't be eating that edge. But hey, next time you do order from a virtual restaurant, or a real restaurant, make sure you keep that receipt for today's sponsor, Fetch. If you don't know about this app yet, it's a personal favorite of mine, and you should buckle in, because it's a doozy. It's free, it's easy to use, and it earns your rewards on anything and everything that you buy, even if it's a completely inedible burger. And that anything isn't hyperbole, it really is on anything that you buy. So even if you can't get your stomach full, you can at least get your wallet full of points that you can then redeem for hundreds of rewards, including Walmart gift cards. Don't like Walmart? How about Starbucks? Don't like coffee? You can even redeem them for Amazon gift cards. If you don't like anything there, well then you got a problem. And it really is that simple. No degree from Hamburger University necessary. You just snap a picture of your receipt or upload an e-receipt using the features on the app and you get the points. It takes seconds to do it and the rewards coming from Fetch, they are precious. So check out the link in the description below and use the code Food Theory or scan the QR code that you see on screen right now to get yourself a hundred points when you snap your first receipt. Again, that's the code you see on screen right now or clicking the link in the description and using the code F-O-O-D-T-H-E-O-R-Y to get yourself a hundred points right off the bat. I'm Matt Pat, that's a theory, and I'll see you next week.